It's now my pleasure to reintroduce Nicole, and um, this afternoon she's going to give us a talk on electrical hypersensitivity, what it is, who recognizes it, biomarkers, causes, types of electromagnetic fields that affect the built environment, exposure standards, demonstration, and solutions. So thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Not Welcome again. This topic is a personal one for me because I, my journey into environmental health began as a result of 10 miscarriages. No one was able to determine why I was miscarrying. We went through, I didn't even qualify for IVF because I got pregnant easily. We went to the recurrent miscarriage clinic in Melbourne. We went to hematologists, we went to IVF specialists, we went everywhere. And all we were told was to keep trying, we don't know what's wrong. Lo and behold, when I started talking to the neighbour, uh, I realised she said to me, oh, no one successfully had children whilst living in this home. And I thought, that's interesting, it's 60 years old. And lo and behold, Mark's <coughs> health, my husband's health and my health had deteriorated significantly moving into this house. And the first sign was insomnia. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was an interesting coincidence we were sleeping on the other side of the wall of a metre box. And when I started to look at the evidence, I realised that AC magnetic fields do increase the risk of miscarriage at 15 milligauss or higher. So once I realised this, at the same time a reproductive immunologist in the US was able to determine from my husband and my blood that um, why we were miscarrying and that it, my immune system was an <coughs> issue and they were able to provide us with a course of treatment to be able to deal with it. <coughs> at the same time, we moved from that bedroom to the back bedroom. In fact, my husband was very reluctant to move to the back bedroom because the ensuite was close by and how can electromagnetic fields cause problems? And I said, mate, you're not getting sex ever again. I'm going to the back and of course that's not the issue within 30 seconds. <laughs> but on the 28th of February, 2013, a, a doctor working at the CSIRO was awarded compensation for injury inflicted as a result of electromagnetic field exposure in this country. It has set a legal precedent in Australian history. More recently, Telstra issued a warning to all of its um, customers warning about the exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic energy and more importantly how to <coughs> reduce one's exposure to the radiation. Times are starting to change. I find an interesting tact by Telstra to do this and it's called the four dog defence. Mm -hmm. This is how big business works to keep people guessing. Firstly, my dog doesn't bite. My product does not harm you. Secondly, and if it does and if researchers are saying it does then we're going to uh, you know, not fund their research and make sure they don't do any more research ever again. <laughs> Secondly, my dog does bite but it didn't bite you. Thirdly, my dog does bite and it did bite you but it didn't hurt you because it's in acceptable levels. And the last one is, my dog does bite and it bit you and it hurt you, but it's your fault because you choose to use a mobile phone, you choose to smoke. And that's the way the industry works. And as you could hear from Ray's passion and frustration of knowing what he knows in environmental health, <coughs> and frustration knowing ultimately it's coming down to dividends for shareholders, mm. is what keeps us exposed and more importantly our children exposed to hazards that are known carcinogens and that can have lifelong consequences. In fact, on endocrine disrupting chemicals, which I'll talk on tomorrow, we are talking about <coughs> transgenerational effects that affect not just the offspring but actually the grandchildren. So with this talk, what I'd like to do is first get his pants off you <laughs> and show you what progressive countries are doing about this issue and then give you very simple tips on how to reduce your exposure and how your patients can reduce your exposure without having to go to new bin and live in a hemp tent. <laughs> I love my technology. I use a mobile phone. Once you understand the physics of radiation, you can significantly reduce your exposure and still use and still live in a technological age. Waiting for high levels of scientific proof before taking action on electromagnetic fields can lead to very high health and economic costs, as was the case with asbestos, lead, petrol and tobacco, according to the European Union, the Council of Europe, 2011. We have this remarkable way that, you, that we have to prove, and the public has to prove, that something's dangerous before the authorities react. 
this system is so idiotic and this is what perpetuates <coughs> this chronic level of hazards that our children are exposed to on a constant basis. Government authorities dispute any harmful effects associated with electromagnetic fields and yet we use them to treat depression, heal bone fractures, treat neonatal jaundice, blue light of course is the most um, effective way to achieve this, which is light, and reduce pain and swelling. The human body is an excellent conductor of electromagnetic fields. In fact, by the very use of the EEG and the ECG, we acknowledge that different organs vibrate at different frequencies. We are 70% water. We conduct electricity very, very well. DNA is actually a fractal antenna, electronic conduction and self-symmetry. It conducts electromagnetic fields very, very well. The World Health Organization classified radio frequencies used in telecommunications as possibly carcinogenic to humans in 2011, 31st of May 2011, and this set the entire telecommunications industry in spin, putting billions of dollars into research to try and um, squash these claims. On March the 19th, 2013, the French National, uh, National Assembly passed an amendment to ban Wi-Fi in nurseries. They're trying to restrict Wi-Fi in schools, um, in, it's particularly in early stages, grade ones to three, in schools. Israel has now restricted use of <coughs> wireless technology up until grade three and limited the amount of wireless exposure in the early grades in primary school. Hopefully by the end of this talk you'll see why wireless technology in schools does not have a place and it's probably, apart from lead paint and lead exposure in children, wireless technology would be my top of the list of the concerns I have as a mother. And the fact that my twins have just started school, they're in grade one and my four-year-old starting school next year. In 2007 the German government recommended wireless technology be avoided and replaced with wired connection. This is the entire German parliament as a result of looking at the scientific evidence for exposure to radio frequencies indicated to its entire population, we can't stop you using wireless technology, but we strongly suggest you don't use it. Use hardwired ADSL or cable instead until we can see if this is um, actually safe. <laughs> Why are the authorities not acting? Well, the exposure is imperceptible, it's ubiquitous. The huge problem the scientific community face is that there will be no control group mm. because the entire planet is bathed with radio frequencies. It has multiple sources going on and off all the time. And of course, what the telecommunications industry end up doing to prevent cause and effect is to keep changing the frequency. So 4G uses a different frequency to 3G, to 2G, to the CDSMA that we used initially in 2G. So it's very difficult to demonstrate cause and effect. And it varies over distance and time. The, f uh, the physics of radiation is such that as you double the distance away from the source, you effectively reduce your exposure by 75%. And that is the key to reducing your exposure. None of these ridiculous gadgets out there that you plug into a PowerPoint and then it, you know, it reduces your radiation exposure. It doesn't work like that. The another reason why authorities are not acting is because it's not an ionising form of radiation. And they've used this argument for a very long time. You know, from uh, X-rays and, of course, gamma radiation, certain types of UV, of course, are ionising forms of radiation. Extra low frequencies and radio frequencies, which are typically found in the built environment, i.e. anything that generates a current, any appliance that generates current, like a meter box or a fridge that has a motor and draws current, will create a magnetic field. It is a non-ionising form of radiation. This is not a valid argument, and I'll give you an uh, example why. Health effects and brain tumours have a very long latency period. And this has been a big problem with this issue is because, you know, I used my phone, I didn't develop a headache immediately, although some people <coughs> with electrical sensitivity will. The great majority of people won't get immediate effects, so we don't see the effect immediately. The fact that most of these brain tumours, gliomas and acoustic neuromas have a 15 to 25 year latency period. You know, a lot of the research was saying, no, no, there's no effects, but it hadn't been in the population for, you know, for 10 years. 
only now because it's been in the general population, mobile phone use has been in the general population for 15 to 20 years, are we starting to see increased risk? And in fact, the study between 2000 and 2008, there was a 35% increase in brain tumours in New South Wales alone in that eight year period, which cannot be explained through other causes. Lack of biomarkers, that is not an argument. <laughs> That is a huge problem because the Austrian Medical Association have a documented procedures on how GPs diagnose electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And they have provided biomarkers you need to check to validate electro electromagnetic fields as a uh, medical disorder. And I want to take a bit of time with you to show you what this is, the Austrian Medical Association protocol for diagnosis. Their argument is there's no established evidence that Wi-Fi adversely affects children. Now, I was on Today Tonight four weeks ago, and it was an eight-minute interview. In fact, it's probably one of the few media interviews I've done where I was actually thought, yet yeah, they actually they aired what I wanted them to air. And at the end of the interview, they said, uh, our PANSA, who are our regulatory authority, refused to uh, you know, comment on anything. But they gave her a statement, the journalist, and they said, oh, there's no evidence to say that wireless technology adversely affects children's health. And I said, of course there's very little evidence because it is unethical to put a mobile phone or a smart meter or a wireless router near a child's head and study its impact. What ethics committee in any university in around the world would actually even approve to do that research? And yet, we have put it out into every home, into all of our schools, without adequately assessing its impact on children's health, who are very much uniquely susceptible to um, electromagnetic fields, as I'll go into. So, of course, there's been little research on children's health because it's unethical. Public don't know that, though. They think it would have been studied, someone must have tested it, otherwise I wouldn't be able to buy it from the Telstra shop. The conflict of interest. I think this is where Don May should take over or with his PhD on the incredible conflict of interest in this industry. It is a multi-trillion dollar industry. In the end, dividends for shareholders is what's going to rule out and this is why we continue to have exposure standards that are not health-based standards. Even our pans are acknowledged, our standards are not for long-term exposure to non-thermal effects. And as a result of this, we don't actually have a standard for electromagnetic fields from our wireless technology, which is just really shameful. The majority of scientific research on EMFs is funded by private industry. And if they actually do the funding, the chances are 30% chance that they'll even show an association. If it's independently funded, there's a 70% chance that there are adverse health effects. And of course, we're not surprised by this. If they don't like the outcome, they may choose not to publish the results. How much research do you think doesn't get published? Mm -hmm. You can just imagine. Or they can actively discredit the researcher. There are amazing researchers in Russia and in Sweden who have been sounding alarms about electromagnetic fields for 15 years, who the telecommunications industry have been trying to discredit. And yet now they've been proved right in terms of the incidence of gliomas and acoustic neuromas. As I mentioned, this is the four dog defence, the second of the four dog defence. My dog does bite, but it didn't hurt you. Harmful effects observed, as I said, 70% of studies conducted by non-industry compared with 32% when funded by the telecommunications industry. So let's have a look at our exposure standards. Yeah. Rather than bamboozle you with all of these, etc., what I want to show you is ICNERP Australia follows the ICNERP standards, the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection, which is a worldwide standard implemented by several Western countries for radio frequency exposure from wireless technology. The problem with exposure standards is the fact that, firstly, Different frequencies have different standards, so that already is very confusing. So in relation to most of the technology we're using now with 3G, we're looking at the power levels or the strength of the field of the radiation that's permitted in Australia based on tissue heating effects is 10 million microwatts per meter squared. When you look at our PANS's website, who are our regulatory guidelines, they provide guidelines to ACMA and to the government about what the standard should be. 
in terms of this, their levels are about 10 million microwatts, but they actually say centimetres. They use a completely different unit, scientific unit, to make it so confusing that you can't compare our standards to other countries unless you go through this amazing complicated mass. So what I've done is convert it into microwatts per metre squared because this is the unit used by the Bio Initiative Report and by progressive countries who are doing something about reducing their exposure to radio frequencies in wireless technology. So in Australia, for 3G, 2100 megahertz, Telstra, the acceptable maximum level allowed to be exposed is 10 million microwatts per metre squared. In Austria, it's 10. So I want you to think about, as your family walking down the street in Austria, that the exposure from that mobile phone tower is a million times lower than what's allowed in Australia. That's not acceptable. Indoors, it's one. The Bio Initiative Report, which is probably the most remarkable report that has come out from over 33 scientists who don't have a conflict of interest, is well worth downloading. It was updated in 2012 and it provides the most recent analysis of electromagnetic field exposure and adverse health effects. And it, it, because of the pressure of this document coming out, the World Health Organization, interestingly, a year later, classified radio frequencies in wireless technology as possibly carcinogenic, group 2B. Building biology standards. Building biology was developed in Germany as a result of the sick building syndrome in the 70s. Because of the oil embargo, buildings were built very tight and created all sorts of indoor air quality issues. Building biology developed as a result of that. But they're also very vocal about electromagnetic fields and the exposure levels. The exposure levels permitted maximum in outdoors is 10 microwatts and indoors 1 microwatt. You cannot get those levels if you have a cordless phone, a mobile phone, uh, a smart meter or a wireless router in your house. It's impossible to get down to those levels. The Bio Initiative report indicated that children should not be exposed to anything above 6 microwatts. And yet our standards allow 10 million microwatts. That is the standard at which it heats the brain, because that's what our standards are based on. Tissue heating effects. The effects, the acute effects, this is uh, 10 million microwatts per meter squared of radio frequencies will heat your brain and cause immediate effects. That's the standard that we have in Australia. France, Russia, India, Italy, Israel, China, Switzerland, Bulgaria, Poland have exposure standards for <coughs> radio frequencies used in wireless technology that are 100 times lower than what's permitted in Australia. China. No? Magnetic fields. The three, there are three fields that affect the built environment, so your home. You've got the electricity that's coming in, and anything that draws current that has a motor, such as your, uh, your fridge, but including your meter box, anything that draws current is going to create a magnetic field. The first time, in fact, the first study on the impact of electromagnetic fields on the general public came out in 1979 by Wertheimer and Lieper. They were two researchers who were looking at childhood leukaemia. So before all the privacy laws, this was in the States, they went to the hospital and said, show us, you know, give us the files of all the children who have childhood leukaemia and we're going to go to their home and see if we can find anything. Lo and behold, they went and checked all of these children's houses and they found the great majority of these children lived near high voltage transmission lines. They didn't know what was coming from the line, so they appointed an a, um, engineer to develop a device, which we call a Gauss meter, to measure the AC magnetic fields from the high voltage transmission lines. And they found anything above 4 milligauss was associated with a doubling in the incidence of childhood leukaemia. Four. I was sleeping in between 30 and 200 milligauss on the other side of the wall of the meter box when Mark and I moved into this home. Meter boxes, the current and the magnetic fields will vary depending on what's in use in your house. The more appliances you have in use, the more the current that goes through your meter box and the greater the magnetic field. <coughs> the problem with smart meters is you not only have the magnetic field, you have the wireless component to it because it's communicating wirelessly to the neighbours then to the power distributor. And also the new smart meters are designed so that they're going to start communicating with all your new whiteboards. 
So in your new white goods that you'll purchase in future, you're going to have Zigbees in them, which will communicate remotely with the smart meter so that the power company can switch off your fridge or your air conditioner to save power if they want to and they can do that remotely. This has resulted in huge uproar in many countries because it ha there have been many fires that have started because appliances have suddenly gone on when people aren't at home as a result of this wireless technology. Let alone the adverse health effects which I will go into. So AC magnetic fields is another type of electromagnetic field that we are exposed to in the built environment. It doesn't often cause problems unless the following happens. Sleep is the most important part of the entire house and it's the first room we check as building biologists. Because as Ray mentioned, electromagnetic fields affect melatonin. And melatonin, of course, your sleep hormone, it sets your circadian rhythm, it has very important immune function, <coughs> etc. So when you sleep near a meter box or sleep near a digital clock radio, the digital clock radios emit anywhere up to 200 <coughs> milligauss, but it drops with distance. So my suggestion is you either get a, a wind-up clock or a battery-operated clock, which uses DC, not AC, and, um, or put your digital clock radio on the other side of the room. So you have to get out to press that switch <coughs> button. I know it's inconvenient, but it's much better. People who are sleeping near digital clock radios, like we can go in, they'll say, look, my smart man just put in, I'm sick because of this, and I'll go in and go, mate, your cordless phone is emitting 10 times more radio frequencies than your smart meter, and it's next to your head. So let's get priorities as to where all the sources are to reduce their exposure, because this, radio frequencies and magnetic fields affect melatonin, and that has massive ramifications in the long term for people's immune system, their sleep cycles, and everything crashes as a result of that. So sleep disturbances and headaches are probably the most common symptoms that people initially develop with electromagnetic field exposure. With the exposure standards for AC magnetic fields, our standard is <coughs> 2,000 milligauss. It just went up from 1,000. The bioinitiative report says no more than 1 milligauss. <coughs> Switzerland says 10. And the building biology standards say no more than 2 in a living space and point to in a bedroom. You'd be hard pressed to find in a built up area to get below 1 milligauss. In Melbourne, if I go and do audits in the high rise apartments, I can't get below 1. And radio frequencies, it's becoming a real problem that we are getting to the extent where we can no longer control our own homes because the wireless router and smart meter from people next to us are emitted over our entire boundary. When you buy a wireless router, it will be set to the maximum level because the manufacturer doesn't want you to complain about you don't get reception in your garden. I don't know why we need reception in our garden, but we do. And we know when Mrs Smith next door and Bob down the street, when his wireless is on, because we can see it on our iPads and our iPhones, so it is set to the highest level. So we are bathing ourselves with radio frequencies. The closer you are to the wireless router, the greater the level of exposure. So it's critical, ideally, that people don't have wireless technology. They go with hardwired ADSL cable instead. If they choose to use wireless technology, then at least at night time, turn it off. So it's not interfering with your melatonin levels. Very important, especially children. You know, headaches in children is an unusual symptom, and yet it's one of the main symptoms with electromagnetic field exposure. The exposure standards are not adequate. Existing standards for radio frequency electromagnetic energy are based on short-term acute immediate health effects at six minutes of heating of tissue. So our standards say, unless that mobile phone is heating your brain, is physically heating your brain, that the, whatever levels you're exposed to is acceptable. Cool. May I just add in one thing? Apart from switching off the, the things like wireless routers, it's important to um, disable the wireless functionality in your uh, 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 iPad or your laptop as well. Yes. Otherwise, whether the um, whether the um, wireless router is on or off, off, your device is going to be emitting and trying to. Okay. So we'll go, we'll go into solutions in quite a bit of detail because it's really important. You need to know what to tell your clients, your patients, in order to reduce their exposure. The exposure standards for AC magnetic fields are based on induced electric currents in the body. The standards do not take into consideration long-term exposure to non-thermal effects 
despite the growing body of evidence of adverse health effects occurring at levels thousands of times below the existing standards. And this is where the Buy Initiative report has been really instrumental in getting it out there and forcing World Health Organisation to start re-looking at this issue. The standards do not consider the most vulnerable. We don't have standards for the most vulnerable. The unborn fetus, children whose skulls are significantly thinner and should not be exposed to radio frequencies. In my book I say, you know, if you're going to have technology, there's a, there's a place for it. However, get, give them phones that they can only text so they have it in their hands, not near their brains or their reproductive organs, you know. Things that they can only text so they're less likely to be exposed, their vital organs, to this type of technology. Sorry, what about Bluetooth? Does that come under the same Yes, umbrella? Bluetooth is a wireless technology. The power output, the strength of the field is decreased, but it's still well above the building biology standards. It's still in the thousands. The algae and the immunocompromised. Standards need to be set to the most vulnerable in our society. What sort of society are we if we're not even protecting our most vulnerable in our society, like our children who are the next generation? What does it say about the society? And we can talk about that as rain right indicated with chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals that have transgenerational effects. They don't affect the birth of the mother and parent, they affect the offspring and the offspring's offspring. Children are not little adults, they have thinner skulls. Their brains are two times more microwave radiation than adults, double. And it goes right across because, of course, they're smaller. They undergo rapid cell division. They're exposed for much longer periods of time. Why? Because when I was in mum's um, uterus, we didn't have wireless technology. This generation does. Their exposure levels are lifelong from utero right to the end. And it interests me that the Russians, who are at the forefront of adverse health effects on radio frequencies and wireless technology, <coughs> they wanted to ban microwave ovens in 1979. That's how concerned they were about microwave technology. But because of uh, pressure on international free trade, the Russians were not allowed to ban microwave ovens, let alone wireless technology, about free trade agreements. So the Russians in their Cold War did a lot of experiments on microwave technology and they're really concerned because they are predicting Russia's uh, regulatory authority have actually stated we expect more people in their late 20s and 30s to have Alzheimer's by the next generation because of wireless technology. We are expecting it. <coughs> It banned public Wi-Fi last year, November 2013, for anyone under 13, uh, 18 years. In Russia? Yeah, yes. last year. Digital dementia, new buzzword in school-aged children. Not only the psychological effects of, you know, oh my God, what does grass look like? Um, but, you know, being connected to this and having to have their face, I mean, psychology, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't even want to go down there, but this is certainly another issue that we have to look at. Countries that have issued warnings. France, 2010, bans advertising on cell phones to children under 12. Belgium, 2013, public health minister bans mobile phone sales for children under 7. Australia, a PANSA issues fact sheet on how to reduce one's exposure to wireless devices. Very small print on their website. Because this is the fourth dog, isn't it? Yeah, we know. My product hurts you, it hurt you, but you choose to use it, so you're to blame. And this is the way it's going to go because this is the way it went with asbestos, PVC, lead and petrol, you name it. Australia 2014, four weeks ago, Telstra issues a warning to its customers. So they're getting geared. The big reason why telecommunications, I think, are doing this is because they can't get insurance for adverse health effects. A lot of the big telecommunication giants around the world the insurance companies not wanting to insure them for adverse health effects, and this is driving a lot of the concerns because of this. April 2009, the European Parliament called for a review of the standard. In fact, the European Union has been quite instrumental in starting to look at this. 2011, they released a report on the potential dangers of EMFs and their effect on the environment. And of course, I'm only talking about human health concerns. What about the bees? You know, if you get rid of be, the first sign that this was a real issue was, of course, on the bee population. Because when you put a radio frequency transmitter, a mobile phone tower, within a certain distance of beehives, 
they start swarming and just in the same way that they leave the, the uh, beehive for good. And they do, they start swarming, then they leave and they never come back because something's affecting their, um, their ability to be able to navigate, etc. I think they've got magnetospheres, I'm not sure what the right term is, in the brains that, that affect them as a result of radio frequency exposure. So, and of course that releases another thing, what about our food source if the bees go, you know? 31st of May, World Health Organisation classified radio frequencies used in wireless technology as a group 2B, possibly carcinogenic. You don't come up to this classification unless you start realising there are adverse health effects. Otherwise, they would have classified it as a, as a three. German Highest Court of Appeal rejected ICNERP and World Health Organisation claims that there was no proof of harm and accepted EMH, uh, electromagnetic sensitivity, as an occupational disease. Setting a safe exposure limit for EMFs is meaningless because it doesn't account for the total exposure to thousands of types of radiation now blanketing our planet. It creates a dilemma, as I mentioned, for the scientific community because we don't have a control. So how do they affect the body? We'll rattle into detail on melatonin. I think the interesting thing about electromagnetic fields and its impact on melatonin is that the body seems to react to melatonin in the same way that it reacts to light. So when during the light, during daytime, our serotonin levels are increased, our melatonin levels drop, at night time the opposite happens. But if you sleep in a high electromagnetic field, the body could be simulated for thinking that it's actually sunlight, and therefore the melatonin levels may not rise, which has massive implications for that person's health. Melatonin supports glutathione peroxidase in reducing free radicals associated with Wi-Fi exposure, the formation of oxidative stress and free radicals and peroxide and superoxides. It activates heat shock proteins in a similar way to heat changes in pH and UV radiation and heavy metals. It increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. This is the one that really worries me. You have a child exposed to a water-damaged building with mould, which is what I talked about this morning, and they are also exposed to high levels of radio frequencies from their iPads, iPhones, at school, at home, smart meters, wireless routers. You increase the permeability of heavy metals, of biotoxins, of chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals into the central nervous system. And the ramifications of this, we don't know. What we do know is autism is continuing to increase. ADHD <coughs> is continuing to increase. And we are at a loss as to determining why these childhood illnesses are increasing to such a degree. Because we often find that we're not looking at the cause of these conditions, which are often complex it degranulates, it sti stimulates neurons into synchronous firing, so you get these muscular aches and uh, pains, fibromyalgic symptoms in a lot of patients with EHS. It degranulates mast cells, so often people get skin reactions, you know, with their mobile phone near their head, they get itching and redness um, as a result of that. It damages DNA. The argument is it's not an ionising radiation, so it can't ionise the DNA, but it can damage it indirectly by increasing stress proteins and causing DNA fragmentation. It can also cause strand breaks and genotoxic effects in fibroblasts, HL60 cells, neuroprogenitor cells, etc. So indirectly, it could increase the risk of cancer. Childhood leukaemia, long-term health effects that are well documented. The World Health Organization in 2002 classified magnetic fields from high voltage transmission lines and from any appliance that generates a lot of current as possibly carcinogenic. The other childhood cancers cannot be ruled out according to the World Health Organization. Brain tumours, a lot of research from Professor Leonard Hardell in Sweden. He has been instrumental in indicating um, concerns about the incidence of brain tumours in um, the human population. And it's indicated because they were showing up much sooner than their latency periods of 15 to 25 years. Breast cancer, anything from 15 milligauss and higher may increase the risk of breast cancer. And I thought it was interesting, I sat next to Professor Bruce, um, I think his name is his cancer specialist who looked at in the Toowoomba, you know, where the cluster of breast cancers occurred in with the women at the ABC uh, radio station. Armstrong. 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 And I asked him about the AC magnetic fields and he said it sits within our standards. I said, the standards are 2,000 milligauss. 
What were the readings of AC magnetic fields? Anything above 15 milligauss in the literature is actually saying that there's an increased risk of, mis of uh, breast cancer. But that wasn't looked into. Neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis have been reported in the literature to be associated in some cases to electromagnetic <coughs> field exposure. And as I've said, the Russians have, are really at the forefront of looking at Alzheimer's risks in children who've been exposed to uh, wireless technology since um, early on. The Interphone study was a study funded by Telstra uh, to, which indicated that there was a lower, that brain cancer risk wasn't an issue. But what they did is they classified a heavy user as anyone who used a mobile phone for 30 minutes a day, which most people do nowadays for more than 10 years. So in fact, their heaviest users now are actually the general public, what most people in the public would use a mobile phone for. So as a result of this, we can conclude, looking at that study, that there's a 40% increased risk of gliomas because in heavy users nowadays is actually 30, they're not heavy users for 30 minutes a day using a phone. They're not considered to be a heavy user. It did not consider exposure to other types of radio frequencies, such as cordless phones, wireless printers, smart meters, etc. So it didn't, it was ridiculous, even though they put millions into this funding, the telecommunications industry, and they didn't look at the other sources of radio frequencies that people could be exposed to. Like, you know, how often do they use a cordless phone, which is a wireless device, using the same radio frequencies? Brain cancer incidence has increased by 35% in New South Wales between 2000 and 2008. New South Wales and ACT. So, what is electromagnetic hypersensitivity? Who recognises it? It's an idiopathic environmental intolerance attributed to electromagnetic fields. It's a descriptive term for symptoms caused by exposure to electromagnetic fields. It's estimated to affect up to 11% of the population, but the real figure is it's difficult to determine because at the moment it's not recognised as a medical disorder by the World Health Organisation, but it is recognised as a dysfunctional disability, a functional disability in Sweden and in Canada, and Medicare will cover that. E EHS can vary from mild impairment to complete withdrawal from society. So more and more people that I'm seeing are moving out of their environments and going to the Northern Territory where there's less chemicals, where there's less electromagnetic fields, and they're trying to find communities where they're uh, electromagnetic free. There are places in Italy and France and throughout the European Union of colonies of people who are severely electromagnetically sensitive, who are developing their own communes to try and get away from this. Nikola Tesla probably one of the most famous scientists of all times, who was hypersensitive to noise and light and suffered from twitches and cognitive impairment, many would say he was mad. May well have been the very first person to suffer from electromagnetic hypersensitivity. In his own admission, in his own biography in 1916. Electromagnetic hypersensitivity symptoms. The first symptoms, headache, very common. Insomnia because of the impact on melatonin. Fatigue, flu-like symptoms, polydipsia, excessive thirst, electric shocks. Don't they mimic the very similar symptoms I talked about this morning with people with biotoxin illness and mold-related illnesses? Maybe inflammation could be involved in this pathway. Heart and circulatory issues, pleuritic chest pain, dysrhythmia, postural orthostatic tachycardia, which is an unusual symptom. Palpitations, cold extremities, cognitive impairment, this brain fog again. These patients, like those with mold, get these brain fogs, dizziness, confusion, anomia, which means they forget what words are. They're looking at the object and they can't remember what's the word of that. Oh, that's a table and I can't actually get it out. They have memory losses, poor concentration, poor short-term memory, learning disorders, I'm intrigued by a lot of the people who are self-diagnosed with electromagnetic sensitivity that many of them become dyslexic. I said, you know, I could read and write, but now I get my words mixed up and it's very difficult for me to read even a page. In some, earaches, tinnitus or imbalance. I mentioned this morning a couple who called me to do an audit of their home and um, it was in Northgate in Melbourne 
and they had five mobile phone towers in visit, which you can see from their master bedroom. Because there was glass in three sides, radio frequencies will come through glass, as opposed to um, brick wall that has size relational vapour barriers. The, you know the blue water, the vapour barrier we have in our buildings? Well, that actually reflects a lot of the radio frequencies. <coughs> so that can be a cheap way to do it. But if you bring in wireless technology inside a new home and you have those vapour barriers, what are you going to do? You're going to reflect it back in. People need to understand that you cannot build a steel frame home with a metal roof and a concrete slab like a Faraday cage bring in wireless technology and now it's bouncing constantly and if it's got a hot spot above that crib where that child is sleeping, that child won't sleep. And you can go to every breastfeeding school or change its nutrition and it won't make any difference. Turning off the wireless technology or moving it away from the other side of the wall of the fridge or a meter box can make the difference from a child sleeping to not sleeping. And the amount of times I've walked in and simply moved a bed to another wall and all of a sudden they're sleeping is quite remarkable and simple to do. This couple had many years disease. She developed many years disease within six months of moving in. Three months later, her husband developed many years disease. Now that's quite odd. So they called me in because they all got sick as a result of moving here and they noticed that when they were in the bedroom, when, the, when she was sick, in fact he was snoring, so she pushed him out of bed and put him in the bedroom downstairs temporarily while well, he had a cold and he slept a lot better. So that's when they called me and said, look, I think something's in the house that's affecting our health. Lo and behold, with my radio frequency meter, I was able to detect thousands of microwatts per meter squared of radio frequencies in their bedroom because I can see five mobile phone towers at the same height coming in at all directions in their master bedroom. This is a problem. The more I do audits in the city and in built up areas, the more this becomes an issue because you've got direct line of sight with many of these mobile phone towers and they're not shielded by the window. So is, could many years be involved? I don't know. I think that's an interesting coincidence. Dry, gritty eyes, ticks, irritation, pressure behind the eyes, skin burning, redness. Not all of the clients with electromagnetic sensitivity will have all of these symptoms. The general ones, the headache, the fatigue and the insomnia are very typical and the muscular aches and pains. Skin may or may not be an issue. Skin tends to be more of an issue with the mobile phone use, particularly if they've got some album fillings and it's acting as an antenna. That can create more of an issue. Crawling sensations. People who are very electrically sensitive will often say they're feeling like burning or crawling sensations along their skin. And they will intuitively get their bed and plonk it in the middle of the room and go, I don't know what it is, but I can only sleep there. And the reason is because electric fields, which I haven't talked about, from 240 volt wiring comes out 1.2 metres out from the wiring in the walls. So wherever the wiring in the walls are, 1.2 metres is where the electric field actually stops. So these people are intuitively putting their beds in the middle of the room going, I don't know what it is, and I think I'm going mad, but you know, I sleep better here. Because oh, you're away from the electric field. Is that if the power points on or off? Doesn't matter. Doesn't electric matter. field, because it's voltage, yep. electric field is created from voltage, whereas magnetic fields are created from current when an appliance is in use. Yep. Muscles, numbness, weakness, restless legs, very common. Spasms, tremors, pain in the jaw and teeth particularly tend to happen with mobile phone use, especially if they have amalgams. Sensitivities. Many of these clients become sensitive to chemicals, light, noise and smell, which is why they tend to move away from society and into remote areas. And it's interesting, people with biotoxin illness that have been going on for a very long time, they become light sensitive, chemical sensitive, noise sensitive. Multiple chemical sensitivity clients are often light sensitive and noise sensitive. Are we talking about the same inflammatory response? Possibly. Body hotspots, depending on the source. Um, example, the right temple pain. They get these unusual forms of pains. The patient can often identify which buildings make them unwell. This is the same with biotoxins and mould. They can walk into a building and start going, oh, no, I know there's mould in here, and they become the barometer. It's the same with electromagnetic sensitivity. They know when they walk in that it's an issue. It abates significantly when they're out of that environment. And that's the thing also with mould. Get them out of the water damage building, get them away from the EMF source, their symptoms start improving. There is relief with avoidance and bathing, because bathing earths them. 
most patients with electromagnetic sensitivity will say, in a bath, I don't get symptoms. And it's like, it's it, because the water is earthing. It's earthing the electric fields around them, etc. Because you are 70% water. So wherever electric fields are, it's going to be coming through you because you can easily earth that. These are very electrically sensitive people who will notice that. The most famous person to have electrosensitivity is Grohar Rundland, who was the former Prime Minister of Norway and retired Director of the World Health Organization, who subsequently retired after her announcement that she was electromagnetic sensitive. I think that was a really interesting coincidence. She would not allow people in her office with mobile phones or any wireless devices because she was so sensitive. Okay. The European um, Parliament published a written declaration calling on the World Health Organization to recognize EHS as a medical condition. Sweden and Spain and parts of Canada recognize it as a functional disability and, and people who have it can actually get Medicare rebates and treatment as a result of it. So who is susceptible? And this is important in your case studies to determine which of your patients are likely to be susceptible to electromagnetic fields. And I'd say potentially everyone, it's just a matter of levels. As Ray indicated with the threshold, once that threshold is reached, suddenly you become sensitive to multiple things. And as I said, these people become sensitive to the chemicals around them also. There's often a history of high or long-term exposure to EMFs. So high levels tend to occur in your telecommunications industry. The research on electromagnetic fields starts back around World War II with the implementation of radars in military bases. There is a lot of evidence of um, soldiers and Telstra, not Telstra, telecommunications workers who have developed radio wave microwave sickness because of their exposure on radar um, stations as a result of military use. So there's actually quite a bit of that evidence. It wasn't until 79 when Wertheimer and Limpa actually associated EMS with general public exposure. So asking their profession, what did they look, are they alignsmen for Telstra, for example? Are they involved in getting into substations or climbing up the power lines? Are they, um, you know, installing these smart meters, etc.? Exposure to chemicals. Many of the clients I deal with may have started with pesticide exposure. I was, you know, a farmer, we did sheep dipping and over time I just got so sick I got chronic fatigue, but now I can't use my mobile phone and I react to people's wireless routers. Once the system shut down, they become sensitive to all of that. So the way to deal with patients with EHS is to, you have to address the chemicals in the household products. You have to address the electromagnetic fields as well. Chronic sleep deprivation, I mean, this is why, of course, it's used in warfare. Japan used it very well in warfare. Chronic sleep deprivation is enough to make you go nuts. And I think this is a huge part of why many of these people with long-term illnesses become so sick. Heavy metal load in the body. Lead, mercury, taking levels, and as Tim indicated, maybe hair analysis isn't always that useful, but there's a place. Urine test or blood testing for these are very important because the more of the heavy metals you have, the more you act as a transmitter for these electromagnetic fields. So that's important, especially with amalgams and mobile phone use. If you've got a lot, you shouldn't be using a mobile phone. I've had calls from three different people who were suicidal who became like that after they had orthopaedic surgery and titanium implants in their spine. Every time they walked into a building where there was wireless technology, it was like their whole body was reacting so violently they had to get out of that building. So if you put metal in the central nervous system and then introduce radio frequencies, which is wireless, which can uh, transmit or act as an antenna, what impact are you going to have? I think orthopaedics needs to look at the implications. Like, I thought that was interesting what you said about cadmium exposure with uh, hip or with hips, and of course with uh, electromagnetic fields. If it's in the central nervous system, they may never be able to tolerate radio frequencies, which means they become a recluse to society because wireless technology is everywhere. We need to start looking at this in all systems of medicine. Surgical metal, metal implants, especially in the spine. Epigenetic factors. Atopic individuals may have hay fever and food allergies and may be more susceptible to EHS. Children, the unborn fetus, the elderly, the immunocompromised, etc., of course, they're going to be susceptible. 